Hey guys, how's it going? It's Jay. And today I'm gonna to go over the Canon R50. Now, this is a beginner's guide. So this is for those of you that are new to the camera and you, you know, you're not exactly sure how to use it. Um, it's kind of overwhelming with all the settings and features. And you know, you invested in this and you really wanna harness the power of the R50. Well, this is the video for you. Like if you really need to start from the beginning and work your way through all these amazing features that this camera offers, um, I'm gonna help you with that. So don't worry, I'm gonna go nice and slow. Um, I explain it and I build as I go. So even if you're starting off knowing absolutely nothing, you guys will get a tremendous amount of value out of this video. So, all right, so this video is gonna be very lengthy. It's gonna be probably over an hour. So if you guys don't have that time and you just wanna get up and running as fast as possible, I made a quick start guide for the Canon R50. Now that also assumes that you're a beginner. So I'll set you up and you're pretty much in full auto mode and you can get out there and start using your camera right away. Below the video in the description area, I'm gonna have timestamps to break up like the different topics. So I'm gonna start off, you know, showing you how it works, go around the body. Then I'm gonna talk about um, using the camera in full auto mode because that's probably what most beginners are gonna start off doing with this camera. And then I will expand off to the more powerful modes such as program auto, shutter priority, aperture priority, manual mode. And uh, you also have scene mode and a couple other things like video, of course. So let's just get right into it, guys. All right, guys, so as you can see here, I got the kit with the 55 to 210 millimeter lens and the 18 to 45 millimeter lens. So I got a nice range here, uh, telephoto zoom and a regular zoom. So pretty much everything is covered. So I went for that kit. It was just over a thousand for all of this stuff. So let me just go over this really quick. So what you have here is the charger for the battery. So the battery just goes into the charger like that. And then you can pull this little thing out and plug it into the wall. That's how the charger works. Now, when it's charging, it'll light up orange. When it's fully charged, this light will light up green. So that's how that works. Now we also have the lens, like this is the 18 to 45. So you could see how small this lens is. And then you have the 55 to 210, which is quite a bit larger. And then we have here the neck strap. I am not gonna put this on though, but the neck strap, I highly recommend putting it on when you get a second. It just weaves through these little metal brackets on the side of the camera here. That'll allow you to like hang the camera on your neck and stuff. Um, if you don't have like a wrist strap or another neck strap that you're gonna use, highly recommend putting this one on because you could bump into something and the camera can fall out of your hand. So you really do want some kind of strap. All right guys, so I'm just gonna move the lenses out of the way for a second. And let me just talk about this memory card. So the Canon R50 has a UHS-1 card slot. So this is a UHS-1 card. So UHS-1 cards are a little bit slower than UHS-2 cards. So a lot of the newer, more professional cameras have UHS-2 card slots. What's cool about that is you can get these uh, memory cards for much cheaper, you know, so it's it's just great for beginners in my opinion that don't necessarily need the faster cards because they are more expensive. Now you do still get benefit if you want to buy a UHS-2 card because when you transfer the files using a memory card reader, for example, to your computer, a UHS-2 card will take advantage of that speed and you'll be able to transfer your files, your photos and videos, way faster with a UHS-2 card in a fast reader. Um, but again, if you're just plugging your camera into your computer, then you're not really gonna see any benefit. So I would probably still get a UHS-2 card just because it's faster when transferring files, but if you're on a budget, you don't have to, you can get away with one of these. So that's this is what I've been using the whole time using the Canon R50. So let me just show you how this goes in. Now on the bottom of the camera here, we have a door. It's got a little slide lever here and you just pop it open like so. So when you open the door, it looks like this, and you can see there's that slot there for the memory card, and it goes in like this. If you're looking at it from this perspective, it just slides in and it kind of clicks into place. Now the battery goes in the same way. If you're looking at the battery, it looks like this. Pushes down and it clicks in, and you can see this little gray lever that will release the battery if you need to take the battery out to charge it. And then if you close the lid, you just have to slide this little thing over and that locks the door. Now also on the bottom, by the way, this is the tripod mount plate, or if you have a mini tripod, you could screw it onto this. It's just a quarter thread is what this is. All right, so looking at the side of the camera here, you got a grip. It's a pretty nice grip. It's got some nice ergonomics to it, but it's not very deep. So it's a little bit hard to wrap your fingers around. So I find holding it like this seems to work the best for me because you can't really grab it like this 
where you would with a larger grip. So I kind of just turn my hand like that and you can see I'm resting my thumb on the thumb rest right here. Now just going around the camera a little bit, I just wanna go over some of these ports really quick. Over here, what you got is the USB-C port. Now you can use this for charging, you could use this for transferring files, and you can also use it if you hook the camera up as a webcam. Now down here you have an HDMI, a micro HDMI port, if you want to hook this up to a television or an external monitor, for example. If you go over to the other side, we have a mic port, as you can see right there. It's just like one of those standard mic ports. There's no headphone jack on this camera, just so you're aware. Now just a quick look at the back. Uh, we have the viewfinder here. There's an adjustment for the viewfinder underneath right here. So you can adjust for your vision. If you wear glasses, you could slide this left and right, and that will adjust the lens in there for your vision. And the viewfinder, if you're not aware, is just basically like a little TV that shows you uh, what you're seeing. It does the same thing as the screen, but it's way better in super bright conditions because when it's really bright outside, you just can't see the screen that good. Now the Canon screens are very good, so you can see them better than let's say the Sony screens, but the viewfinder is m way better if you're tracking moving subjects and things like that. So keep that in mind. So you can just put this up to your eye like this, and that's how you can do it. Now, if you're wearing glasses, you can pull them up and really get your eye close. So also looking at the back here, you have this LCD screen. It's a really nice screen. And what's cool about this screen is if you swivel it like that, you could now use the camera in selfie mode. So this is how you would use the camera in selfie mode. And another cool thing is the screen swivels. So you can swivel it around like this. So if you have the camera like over your head and you need to see the screen, you can do it like that. Or if you have the camera like on the ground, you can have it this way. And this works great for when you're on a gimbal as well because you can angle it however you need it for uh, gimbal work and stuff like that. Also, when you close the screen this way, you have like an armor mode. And this is great for when you're stowing your camera and stuff. So you, you know, just in case something bounces around in your camera bag, it won't scratch the screen on you. Highly recommend leaving the camera in armor mode if you're not using the camera, especially if you're putting it in your camera bag and stuff. So continuing on the back of the camera here, you have a bunch of buttons. Now you got a menu button, a playback button. Guys, I'll go into way more detail as to what these buttons do once we turn the camera on and stuff. So anyways, we got a menu button, playback button. You have a control, a pad here that's a four directional control pad with a center button that acts as your enter button or set button. It also is the Q button. You have an info button here. And over here, right by the thumb grip, you have this button here, which stands for focus mode. So you can kind of change the focus area and stuff with this button, depending on what mode you're in. And same thing with this button up here. This is an exposure lock button. So it just depends on what mode you're in. Full auto mode, a lot of, like a lot of these buttons don't do anything, just so you're aware. Now, moving on to the top of the camera. We have here what's called a mode dial, and you can spin the mode dial like so. Highly recommend for now, just putting it in the A plus mode. Don't worry, if you guys are more advanced, you can absolutely go to the more advanced modes, but if you're brand new to the camera, highly recommend just putting in A mode for now because I want you guys getting out there and using the camera and having fun. I don't want you frustrated getting terrible pictures because you're not exactly sure how to set the camera. If you put it in auto mode when you're first starting off, it's gonna do a great job for you like 90% of the time. So just set it there for now, and like I said, once you get more comfortable, um, you could then expand out to other modes. So also on the top, we have here a record button for recording video. We have a control wheel here, which will do various things when you're using the camera and stuff, going through menus, when you're in playback, things like that. Now up here, we have the shutter button. This is how you go about taking photos. Now it's a two-stage button. When you press the button a little bit, it's gonna focus for you. When you press it all the way, it's actually gonna take the photo. And over here, we have an ISO button. And then, of course, we have the on-off switch right here. And I really like that toggle. It's a nice hard toggle, so you're not gonna turn the camera on and off by accident. And also on top of the camera, we have the flash. So it's got these little tabs where you can pull it out and you could see the flash unit there. So when the camera's telling you, please raise flash, uh, that's, what it, that's what you gotta do. You gotta pull that up if you wanna use the flash. And then on top of here is a smart hot shoe that you can use to mount various accessories, flash units, uh, microphones, things like that. And also on the top of the camera right here, you can see this little symbol 
That stands for where the sensor is. So that's the sensor plane if you need to measure for macro photography and things like that. And then we have a little speaker here. All right guys, so looking at the front of the camera here, we have this, this is an AF illuminator that'll help you focus in really low light conditions. Um, a lot of times that works as the self timer as well. When you're using self timer, it'll blink. So what we have here is the camera body cap. So this protects the sensor when you don't have a lens attached. So basically what we do is you just turn this and you can see this little dash there. That dash tells you that you're lined up to the red dash, as you can see right there. And that's where you would go, you know, when you need to put it on, you can just turn it. And that red dash also is what you need to reference when you're mounting a lens. Now this is the APS-C sensor and you always want to make sure that you have that covered with either the body cap or a lens. So let me show you how to mount a lens. All right, so now notice on the back of the lens you have these connector points and then you can see the connector points here. That's how the camera communicates with the lens. Now if you turn the lens, you're gonna see how it has that little red dash there. That red dash lines up to the red dash on the lens mount here, the RF lens mount. And this is an RFS lens, by the way, because it's a crop factor sensor. The full frame lenses are RF lenses. The crop factor lenses are RFS lenses, just so you're aware if you're shopping for different lenses and stuff. So then what you do, once you get that on there, you have to twist it to the right and you'll hear a click. Now that click, is the lens pin that holds the lens on. And this is the lens release pin right here. So if you squeeze the lens release pin in, you could now unscrew the lens and it will unlock. And look, you could see the pin moving. See that pin moving? So that's how that works, like so. And the 55 to 210 will mount the same exact way. You just gotta take this off and it mounts exactly like this lens. Uh, it's just a different style lens, that's all. And also, just so you guys are aware, this lens is actually a collapsible style lens. So you have to open it up before it starts working. So like I said, if you go past 18, that's the closed you know, position right there. But when you open it right there, that's 18. So now you have 18 to 45 is your zoom range. And you have to manually turn this to zoom the lens. So I'm just gonna take the lens cap off. And that's what the front of the lens looks like. And also guys, if you look at the front of the lens, it has like writing on there and it'll tell you like what size filter thread, for example. So you can see right here on the bottom, it says 49 millimeter. Uh, and that's what size the filter thread is. If you wanted to screw on like ND filters, for example, or a polarizer filter, something like that, that 49 is what the millimeter is for the lens thread. Now this wheel here is used for manual focus and depending on the camera, you can also program this for custom functions as well. So here is the on and off toggle. So let's turn this beast on. All right, so when you first turn this on, you are presented with this menu here. So I'm gonna select English, and it wants you to set the date and time. So let me do that. So I'm just gonna click set here, and the month is gonna be March 26th. You can just touch around here, like so. You can also go and select your time zone here, but I'm just gonna set it to the correct date and time. That seems to work good. Click OK. Now it's also prompting you to connect to the Canon Connect app, which will allow you to remote control the camera and also take photos and videos off the camera to your smart device. Now guys, I have a dedicated video on the Canon Connect app. So just be sure to check that video out if you wanna do that. So I'm in full auto mode and you can see how it pops up with this stuff, letting you know like what these buttons do. It gives you like a little tutorial uh, when you first turn the camera on and that's pretty cool. So it's just telling you here that you can adjust some features if you click on that button. So I'm just gonna click hide info. I don't want this popping up every time. Click okay. And now it's popping up with the other option here, which is telling you that it's gonna apply effects and stuff like that, which is cool. I'll show you more about that in a little while. Click okay. And now we're presented with this very basic menu, which is you know optimized for beginners. Now it's telling me to raise the flash. Remember how I showed you that earlier? And that's just because I'm pointing down at the desk so it sees a very dark scene. But if you turn the camera like this, let me just swivel it around here. And now you can see I have this test chart in front of me. So watch when I press the shutter. You see the green coming up? Those are the autofocus points and it's just gonna pick what it thinks you wanna focus on because I'm in full auto mode. And now if I press the button all the way, it will take the photo as you can see there. Now notice these modes down here, these little buttons that I showed you earlier. 
Um, there's three different flavors. So if I click on the top icon, you can see there's like three different creative type flavors, I'm gonna call it. So you have Creative Assist. Creative Assist is the one that it's in now. And what that allows you to do is if you hit that little paintbrush, it comes up with all these different options. And it's just telling you here, choose an effect from the preset and then shoot. So I'm just gonna click the little arrow there so it hides that and doesn't show me next time I bring that up. Click OK. And again, you have presets here on the left, so you can just go through and select all these different presets, which is awesome. And there's a lot of them in here that you can play with. So that's where you can go to do that. I'm just going to leave that on default. But you also have a background defocus feature. So you can pretty much slide this and make the depth of field more. If I want the background to be sharper. Then you have here brightness. So you can just make the image darker or brighter. You can change the contrast. You can scroll over. you got more options here. You can change the saturation. And let me just go into the menu and change the screen timer because it keeps timing out really quick. So if I go into menu here. All right guys, so right here under power saving, I'm gonna change this and notice how it says screen dimmer is set to 10 seconds. I'm gonna change that to disable. So it stops dimming because I'm doing this tutorial here. I don't want the screen to keep dimming on me, but just so you know, that's where this feature is. If you wanna turn it on, turn it off or change the timer. Screen off, you can set that as well. Auto power off is set to 30 seconds. And I'm gonna change that to at least a minute just for now, again, because I'm doing this tutorial. All right, so again, guys, remember how I told you you could zoom with the lens? So this is zooming in and out, and you can see how the scene is changing there while I zoom. Now over here in the lower left, we have this little icon, and it looks like a little truck uh, with an off and a little hand there. If you press that, that will enable touch shutter, as you could see here. So now if I just touch the screen, it's gonna focus and take the photo wherever I touch, like so. And that works really good, and it's a cool feature. So you could just disable that by touching this again. Now, this other icon here is your image size, so it's allowing you to change that. You can also change it to raw quality if you want in there by hitting info raw. This is where you can turn raw quality on if you want. I have it set to JPEG right now because I'm shooting in full auto and a lot of the features in full auto won't work in raw. So I tend to use JPEG when I'm using full auto. Now if we go back up here into the creative assist area, we have this other option here. Now this is called creative bracketing. And what this does is it sets the camera up and It'll just take multiple shots and give you different looks. I'll show you what I mean, watch this. So now if I hit the playback button, that little uh, playback on the bottom of the screen, you see how there's multiple versions of this image? So now if you scroll through, you can see the different versions. And that's what it did in that creative mode. This is a cool mode because you can actually just set it to this and give you like a different look. I, I think that's pretty cool. And you could see a couple of samples here when I was playing around um, at these signs and, and this roof line. And it's interesting how the different filters will give you different textures and stuff. So that's pretty fun to play with. Uh, I recommend checking that out. If we go back in here and we go over to the right one, we have uh, more advanced processing based on scene detection. So I'm gonna select OK. So now you'll see that it's flashing up here and that's telling you what scene the camera is recognizing. So right now it's showing me this little sun scene. I don't really know what that scene is off the top of my head, but if we go and take the photo, it actually took multiple images. And now it's doing processing and it's gonna try to give you the best image possible. So that's how that works. And if I zoom in here, notice how it switched to macro mode now because it thinks that it's a macro scene. And you hear that, it just took like 10 shots or whatever. So it's just doing AI based stuff. So you can see here this little ES came up on the screen. That stands for electronic shutter. So in this mode, it switched to electronic shutter, rattled off a bunch of shots, and it's trying to give the best macro shot uh, possible based on how the programming algorithm inside the camera works. So that is pretty much how full auto mode works. And let me just go into the menu here and show you what full auto mode looks like when in the menu, because the menu actually changes. Now, if we scroll here to the left, to the camera, notice how there's only five like sub tabs. So that's because we're in full auto mode. But if you go in here, you can change a bunch of stuff. So you have shooting mode here, assist mode, image size, 
still image aspect ratio. You can change the way this looks. If you guys want a square image, you can do one to one, for example. If you want an eight by 10 crop, you could do a four by three, for example. I'm just gonna click OK. By the way, guys, I'm just hitting this Q button, set button for OK, if you don't wanna touch the OK button on the screen. That's what I'm hitting is this center button here. All right, so I'm just gonna put it back to the automatic creative assist mode. I like that one the best. I'm just gonna put it back there and I'm gonna click OK. Now also notice this little magnifying glass up here. You can select that and it'll zoom in for you. So you can just double check your focus and make sure that what you're seeing is what you want. You can zoom in more. As you can see there, it's like super zoomed. It's gonna to turn touch shutter back off. There we go. So now touch shutter is disabled. You could see there and you could see by the little icon, it looks like that little truck again. So that's where we're at with touch shutter. All right, guys. So again, we're in full auto mode here and there's a couple of other features that I just wanted to show you. You can hit the info button here and it'll bring up more information. It'll actually change the way the screen looks. So that right there is an auto leveler, which is really cool. It'll actually let you know if the camera is level and a great feature. If you hit info again, now the screen is just off. This is minimal and this is more stuff, which I actually like. I like having it set here and or here. I like seeing the histogram as well when doing more advanced uh, shooting. So that's what the info button does. Now, one other thing I wanna show you is this button over here. It stands for drive modes. And if you click on this button, it's set to single shooting by default. But if you guys wanna take rapid fire, like fast shooting, like high speed, you're tracking moving subjects, sports and stuff like that, this is where you would go to do that. Now you got high speed continuous. Let me set it to that and I'll show you what I mean. If I just point and shoot at the target now. So that's rapid fire mode. And there's different speeds, like there's high plus, that'll go faster, as you can see here. And you can go really slow with the low speed one. Now here is where self timer is. So that'll just set a self timer for you, which is quite nice, as you can see here. That's the self timer and you can see the AF illuminator flashing. So if you're trying to do a self portrait and things like that, that's where you would go. And then you have self timer continuous. So you can actually do the same thing, but it'll, it'll take multiple shots for you. So this is great for doing like family portraits and stuff because someone always has their eyes closed. So you could set that self timer uh, and then you can go, you know, say take four shots and select it. And now if we go, it's given us a long time here. It's 10 seconds. So watch this. See that? So it did a 10 second timer and then it took four shots. So that's a good way to go. Again, if you're taking family portraits and things like that, depending on what you're up to, you know? So I'm just gonna put it back to single shooting. All right, so again, in the menu here, we are kind of limited because we're in full auto mode, but if you scroll through, you can use the control wheel here on the top or you can use this directional pad or you can just touch and you know drag even. You could do all sorts of ways to navigate this. And there's a lot of features in this camera. So when I go into the more advanced modes, there's even more features, but in full auto mode, this is what it looks like. So you have your image quality here, aspect ratio, like I was saying, you have your drive mode, release without card. So this will actually just let you take a photo if you don't have a memory card in there. Now image stabilization mode, you can go in here and you can turn image stabilization on. Digital stabilization, you can also turn on, but it'll actually crop in a little bit. I'm just gonna click menu to go back. This is touch shutter. I already showed you that on the screen with that little button on the bottom. You got image review. Now, when you take a photo, the image will come up on the screen for a second or two. That's what image review is. And that's turned on and it's set to two seconds. So I actually normally turn that off on my cameras, but a lot of people like that feature. So I'd recommend leaving it on. Viewfinder display means you'll actually see the image preview in the viewfinder. So that's disabled by default because you know it assumes you're tracking moving subjects. You're not gonna want the preview coming up. <laughs> That'll be really distracting. Shooting info display. So this will just show all the different stuff on the screen when you're navigating and you hit the info button. You can turn on a grid for the rule of thirds, which will help you uh, compose and things like that. The histogram, 
you can change and it can change the size of it, which is quite nice. It's got an RGB option and a large small option. I like that. Lens info display in manual mode. It'll give you the focus distance, focal length. It'll tell you what the lens focal length is, which I really like. Now reverse display, that will like flip the display around. So if you want it in like mirror mode, you can go and use that option. Now you can also change the way your display looks because the viewfinder is so small, it's kind of hard to see the edges when you have your eye up to it, especially if you're using glasses. If, you don't, if you're not using glasses, you can get your eye really close, it's a little easier to see. But again, if you're using glasses, display two is a little bit better because it just crops in that little bit so you can see the edges better. Movie record settings, this is where you can go and change your movie record settings. I recommend going in here and setting it to 4K. I mean, you got a 4K camera. Uh, you might not want the 4K because it'll fill up your memory card really quick, but this is the feature that I use most, 4K at 24 IPB for this particular camera. But you have the 60 frames per second option for HD, and then of course you have the 30p 4K option as well. Now shutter button function, when you're in movie mode, if you press the shutter, it will like reactivate the focus for you. So that's what it's doing by default. Now if we go in here, you can see how there's a bunch of stuff that's grayed out. And again, that's because we're in full auto mode. Preview AF is enabled. AF assist beam is on. That's that light that lights up you saw a minute ago with the self timer. Playback mode, this is where you can go in and you can look at your photos and videos that you have stored on the camera and you can delete them, you can protect them, things like that. You could rate them, print order. Creative assist, you can go in here and you can play with the creative assist options. Playback creative filters, red eye correction, you could resize the images, you could crop the images. A little bit of uh, post-production work you can do here on camera. You can create a slideshow, which is really cool, especially if you have a you know, HDMI cable plugged into a TV or something. And then you have image jump, so if you turn with the dial on the top here, it'll jump 10 images as opposed to just hitting this left-right option. Playback information, you can turn that on and off. AF point display, I like to enable that. And when you enable that, when you go into the playback menu, it'll show you where the AF points were. You can see here, they're lit up red. If we disable that and we hit playback, see how those aren't there now? So I really like that because if you're focusing on like a, a human and you wanna make sure that it focused on the eye, you know, IAF, um, you can go into the playback and you can see that it was on the eye. And it's just a quick reference, like, all right, that focus is probably perfect because it was on the eye. So I always enable this, but like, you, like I just showed you, it can be a little bit much on a shot like this. So you might want to turn that off depending on what focus mode you're using and things like that. You can turn that on, again, if you're going to an HDR TV and you're, record, and you're playing back HDR footage, you can turn that on there. Now in here is where your like connection options are, and this is where you would go to connect to your smartphone and all sorts of stuff like that. You got a wireless remote option. You got the EOS utility, print from, from Wi-Fi printer, advanced connections, airplane mode, Wi-Fi settings, Bluetooth, camera name. You got GPS settings here, reset communication settings. This is where you can go and turn off Bluetooth and things like that if you had it connected to an old phone, whatever the case may be. And remember guys, I have that Quick Connect Canon app tutorial that'll show you how to use some of these features uh, in detail. I'm not gonna cover it in this video though because I made a whole dedicated video on the app, which is really awesome by the way. Now up here we have the wrench icon and this is where some of the more uh, advanced settings are located. So file numbering, you can change the folder that your files are saved in. This is where you can go and format your memory card. Now auto rotate, if you're in vertical format versus landscape, this is where you can go and change that. You can add the rotation info to the file. So if you bring it into a post editor, it'll automatically recognize the orientation. Date and time, we already went over that. Here's where your in uh, language settings are. Now in page two, this is where you can go and set the camera for NTSC or PAL mode. So if you guys are looking for 50 frames per second, 25 frames per second, if you're you know, a PAL region user, you're gonna expect to see those frame rates. This is where you would go to change that. Um, in North America regions, you are set to NTSC and that gives you 24 frames, 30 frames, 60 frames. Now, mode guide, you can have that enabled 
or disabled and that when you turn the mode dial it'll tell you what each mode is it's feature guide same thing um, beeping you can turn that on and off the camera beeps when you focus and stuff so I'm just leaving it enabled for now but I would recommend turning that off because the beeping is kind of annoying you can change the volume here power saving I already showed you when I changed the uh, screen dim timer now screen view display you have a bunch of different options in here you can go in here and change that and uh, it's pretty powerful. You can set it to, you know, just have the viewfinder on only, uh, just the screen only, for example, so it won't switch to the viewfinder. That's where those features are. Screen brightness, this is another really powerful feature. And if you're out in the sun, you're gonna wanna make the brightness higher. If you're in really dark conditions, you might wanna make the brightness like a lot lower. Viewfinder brightness, you got options for that as well. It's set to auto, but you can change that to manual if you want. Now here's where you can go and fine tune the viewfinder color, which is amazing, very powerful. User interface magnification. This will allow you to like zoom in on the actual screen itself and it might make it easier for you to read if you need to set that. So if I double tap with two fingers, you see how it zoomed in and now you can like pan around. So it's a double finger tap for that feature. So if you guys are having a hard time reading the screen, visually impaired, you can double tap and get a bigger screen. I know my dad would love this feature for sure. He has a demacular degeneration, so his vision is really starting to go and he has like a magnifying glass to see like small text. So this feature would be great for somebody like him. HDMI resolution, you can change that here. Touch control is set to standard. You have sensitive and disable. So if you guys do not want touch, if you are somebody that hates touch or you keep touching and it's messing you up, you can turn that off here. And then you have a USB app connection option there. Battery info, if you go in here, it'll tell you how much battery life is left and what kind of battery and so forth. Now here is an option to go to the manual, which is really cool. You, on your phone, go over this image, it'll bring you right to the manual. So now you have access to the manual on your phone easily. And here's the current firmware version. So that is a basic menu breakdown when in full auto mode. So now what we're gonna do is we are gonna change the camera to program auto mode. Now program auto mode, as you can see here, it gives you this preview of what the mode does. Remember that mode uh, info? Uh, option that we just saw a minute ago. This is the info option. So you can make this so it doesn't come up when you change modes. But as you scroll through the modes, it gives you like a preview here. So I just want to put it in program auto mode for a second and go back into the menu to show you how much deeper the menu is. You see now how it has six, seven, eight, and nine. So if you go in here, you're going to have a lot of other options. You got HDR shooting, auto light optimize. There's a lot of stuff in here that wasn't in here. So now you could see on page six, we have focus bracketing, drive mode, silent shutter function, a shutter mode you can change, electronic first curtain is what it's on now, release shutter without card, that was available in the other menu. Now here we got more features here, display simulation, optical viewfinder simulation, view assist, that's pretty cool. So it'll make the viewfinder pretend it's an optical viewfinder. That's a really interesting feature, and that's great if you're using off-camera flash. If you're using off-camera flash, you are going to want that on. Movie recordings, got a bunch of other features in here. So now on AF, we have AF area. As you can see here, you can go in and you can change all the different autofocus areas. All right, so this is what it looks like when in program auto. And remember, I can change this screen by hitting this info button, and it'll give you a lot more info as you can cycle through there like so. Now also in full auto, you can hit this Q button here in the center and it brings up all this stuff. So now you have like an, a tremendous amount of power in program auto and program auto is basically full auto mode. The camera is still gonna do like all the thinking for you, but it gives you like more power if you need it. And an example of where you would need more power, remember how I told you like full auto will work like 90% of the time? Well. I was out there shooting and I'll show you these photos as I'm talking here. I was trying to take a photo of this sign through branches and in full auto mode, even touching the screen around, I was touching just to try to get it to focus where I wanted. It just wouldn't work. It kept focusing on the branches. So what I did was I switched to program auto mode and then I hit this button over here to change the focus area. So this button here is the a button to do that. And now if you hit this little 
icon, you can change your focus area. And what I did was I selected this one here, single point. So now the camera is only gonna focus on this one point at a time. And that's what I set the camera to. So for example, if I go to focus now, so you can see that single point, it's limited to that, that one area and that's all it can focus on. So if I select over here, it can only focus on that single point area. And this is where you would need, you know, if the camera's not focusing on what you want, you would need to go in there and change that. Now, you can get to that from the Q menu as well. It's this top left button. That's where you can go. So this is spot AF. You got one point, you got expand. You have expand AF area around, and you can see, let me just hit my info button to clean this up a little bit. So look at what this one looks like. You see how it's a square and it has the expandable points? So this is great for tracking moving subjects in particular. This one on the right is whole area AF, so this will use the entire screen, and that's what it's set to by default. So when in full auto, of course, if you want to hit record, all you have to do is hit the record button, like so. And you can hit that again to stop recording. And again, if I go back into program auto mode here, it works the same way. You press the button like this to focus, push it down to take the photo, and then hit record if you want to record video. It works exactly the same way in program auto, like so. All right, so again, looking at the back of the screen, you can hit the info button to display the change the way the display looks. This is the more simplistic look here. Um, but check this out, you can just touch around and change this stuff. So this is the exposure compensation. So you can change that to raise the exposure comp if you want. And this is basically brightening the scene or darkening the scene. And you remember in full auto mode, um, it had the option in the creative assist to change the brightness and the color and stuff like that. You can, this in program auto mode, you have like the more traditional camera tools to do those sort of things. And you can also change the ISO here. So auto ISO is what it's set to automatically by default, but you can hard set that to like 100, for example. So again, program auto mode is giving you more power. It's like a full auto mode that gives you more power. And it also has the touch shutter option here. And notice how it says 28 there, that's the camera zoom. So if you zoom the camera in, you can see it's changing. Now it's at 45 millimeter. Now it's all the way at 18 millimeter. And uh, just the weight of the camera is like pushing it to 24. And remember, you could hit this set slash Q button, or you can hit the Q button up here. And that brings up the Q menu. So now going through this Q menu. So if you select one of the options on the left or right side, the variables for that option will come up on the bottom. So if I select one shot, for example, you could see now on the bottom, these are the different options. So one shot is you basically press the focus button, it'll lock once it focuses, and then you'll take the photo. It won't continually focus. All right, so AI focus will basically choose whether to use one shot or servo. Now servo will constantly focus. So that's great for moving subjects. The focus will just constantly be like monitoring and tracking. So it uses servo in video mode. But again, if you're trying to track moving subjects in photography mode, you would want to use servo. But you can use AI focus and the camera will decide whether it needs to be in continuous or one shot. Probably leave it in AI focus for the most part. So now if we go to the next option here, we have subject to detect. Now you can select auto here and the camera will just analyze what you're doing and try to figure it out for you. But you can also hard set it. So you have animals here, you have people, you have automobiles. So I'm just gonna put that back to auto. Auto seemed to do a pretty good job. Now over here, the next option, again, this is gonna be your image size and you can change it here. You can enable raw. If you click that option, this is where you can enable the raw. By the way, this is compressed raw and this is regular raw. So the compressed raw will just be a smaller file size than regular raw. Trying to save memory card space. Now this next feature here, is metering mode. So what metering mode is, it's basically how the camera determines how bright to expose the scene. So it analyzes the scene and it'll use, in this case, it'll use like the entire sensor to try to evaluate how bright or dark the exposure needs to be. If you set it here, the camera will just 
use mostly the center area of the screen. If you set it here, the camera will use just a tiny little spot for exposure. So why you might wanna use this is if you're trying to expose for something that's extremely bright, like a light bulb or a wedding dress or frothy white water in direct sunlight, for example. You can use these metering mode tools to help you with that. And you can see here what the meter looks like on spot mode. You see how it's like a circle? I'm just gonna put it back to evaluate metering. And now over here, you have a back button that'll bring you back, it'll bring you out of the queue menu. Now you have this flicker option here, anti-flicker shoot. You could turn that on and off if you guys are having problems with flickering lights. So this is a pretty cool feature if you're having those issues. White balance, white balance controls how the camera decides what white is. Like, is white like gonna be like a little bit bluish or a little bit yellowish? Um, that would be like warm and cool. White balance is what determines that. So right now it's set to auto white balance, but you can set the camera hard set to like sunny weather. And that if the sun's out, you can just hard set it to that. If you're in shade, you can set it to that. Cloudy, you can set it to that. When you guys are recording videos in a constant lighting environment, I highly recommend hard setting this because sometimes auto white balance will fluctuate. So if somebody walks into the scene and they're wearing like all blue or something like that, that might trigger the auto white balance to shift the colors a little bit. And that doesn't look very good when recording video or when you're taking photos even, you know, if you're in a party uh, and you're just taking photos of different people, if the auto white balance keeps changing, it's not gonna look good. Skin tones are gonna look good in one shot, not good in the next shot. So this is why you would wanna hard set your white balance. So that's what that does. Now down here, we have picture style. You can go in here and you have standard and these are just different styles and it'll give you a clue as to what each of these do. Now you have portrait, and again, you can see these numbers changing. You can actually go in here and dial in these settings. So you can manipulate this and create your own looks. So I highly recommend playing with this stuff because if you just wanna get the best possible quality straight off the camera, and you're shooting JPEG, for example, you want the camera to do all the work for you, you can go in here and really dial in these settings and get the camera to produce exactly what you want straight off the camera. You know, if you're shooting landscapes, this will emphasize the greens and the blues and uh, fine detail, make images a little bit sharper, for example. Then you have neutral, so if you're shooting raw um, or JPEG and you wanna do your editing you know, post-processing, you can go for a neutral look and it'll just be like, won't be as saturated, um, not as sharp. It'll allow you to do that after the fact if you want. So a lot of times people don't like JPEG images because they're like overdone or overcooked, some will say. They look too sharp, too much color. This is where you can go in and change that stuff. So like I said, neutral is a good place to go. And you got faithful, monochrome, and then you have user defined. So you have a couple of presets here that you can make. I'm actually gonna put it on standard because that's what I tend to use. And I don't really want it changing depending on the image. I just like to leave it as standard for now. So that's what I'm gonna do there. Now, if we go to the next option here, we have creative filters. Now this is pretty cool and it's pretty fun. You can go in here and we got a bunch of different filter options. You can scroll through them. You got grainy black and white, soft focus, fisheye effect, art bold effect, water painting, and so forth. That's what those options are. And then here is your aspect ratio if you need to change that. All right, guys, one other thing I wanted to show you here was the AFMF button here. You could see that. That's how you would switch the camera into manual focus. So if I switch it to MF mode, like right here, and you can see this scale comes up. Now watch this. So now if I turn this ring, you can see how it's manually focusing. See that? So this is the manual focus. This is the zoom. And then this one will allow you to dial in the manual focus, as you can see here. And it gives you this cool scale right on the screen, something like that, and there you have it. And also note how it says MF there on the top left, so you can see that. And I'll just hit this button again, switch it back to AF for autofocus. So program auto mode basically just gives you way more power, even though it's a full auto mode. And you can see in the menu system how a lot of that stuff that was grayed out is no longer grayed out. Let me show you some of these more advanced auto modes. If we go over here to this mode here, hybrid auto. So hybrid auto, as you can see here, because I have the description enabled, it creates a digest movie with your stills. 
And if you click that, it gives you more information. Clips of scenes before each shot are combined into a digest movie. Now I played with this, it's, it's actually a pretty fun feature. So if you're just walking around the town and you're taking some photos and stuff, when you go to take the photo, the camera will actually record for like two seconds before you take the photo. And it'll like turn that into a movie. So it'll show you like a two second clip, then it'll show the snapshot you actually took. And then it puts that into a movie. Now, it still keeps the photo separate on the memory card, but it also gives you this like montage movie, which is cool, you know, it's just a cool feature. You might not ever use this, but I think it's a, I'm glad they included it with this camera because it's just fun, you know, doing stuff like this. So, and that's what it's about, having fun out there, you know? So that's what that feature does. If we go to scene mode here, the SCN mode, if you hit this little arrow, it'll tell you by selecting the scene, you can shoot images with cameras, auto configurations and optimal settings. Now, you can go in here and choose the scene. Now you remember before when I had it in full auto um, enhanced mode, how on the top left it showed that macro symbol and it also showed the picture of the sun. That was like the camera detecting the scene. So this is sort of the same thing, except this gives you the power to pick the scene yourself. So you can go in here and hard set the scene to whatever you want. Group photo, landscapes, you got panorama. Now panorama, will allow you to, if I hit, let's just select OK. So it, you could set the direction and stuff like that. And vibration sound may occur when stabilization panning for panoramas. OK, click OK. So panorama, notice how it has an arrow here. And you can see how there's like this, like gray, like shaded area there. So it's showing you like what to do. So you would basically start like this, start firing and then like move around like that. Now it's not obviously not gonna work in this environment. You really need to be standing and you can get a nice cool pano. Like, you know, and it really works well. The Sony cameras have this also, um, some of the more beginner oriented cameras. And uh, that's what panorama mode does. All right, so to get back into the scene selection, you can just click that icon on the top left. And now you have an option for sports. So guys, again, if you're not sure how to set the camera up, this is a great way to go. Set it to scene mode, select sports, and then take pictures of sports. So full auto again will detect that that's what you're doing, but this is a more powerful way to do it. So this is like hard setting the camera to sports mode. And uh, then you got a kids mode. This is great. If you're trying to track your kids running around, you know how difficult shots like that can be. And that's one of the reasons you bought a nice camera like this. So set it to kids mode if you're taking photos of children and uh, this will really help you out. And then of course you have panning mode, which will allow you to pan and it'll slow the shutter down for you, giving you that little bit of motion blur effect. And the camera's gonna take care of the settings for you. You got macro close-up, food photography, handheld night scene. So this will actually take multiple photos, hand holding, combine those images and give you a really nice, clean, sharp result. So really low noise and it'll sharpen up any little blur that you might have from hand holding. And then of course you have HDR backlit control. So if somebody's backlit by something really bright and you want them, you know, their face to be exposed properly and as well, you can go to HDR backlit control. And then of course you have silent shutter. So this would be silent mode. If you're inside, you know, at a wedding or something like that, and you want to take photos, but you want to be quiet, you can set it to silent mode. Now, if we go to the next mode, creative filters. Creative filters, I already showed you from the Q menu, and that just allows you to go in and select your different filters. So this is just a different way of looking at it. And you can see here, we got all sorts of cool effects, as you can see. So that's what that feature does. Then, of course, you have movie mode. So now, movie recording, you can also select your mode. So if you go to choose mode there, this is what you got. You got movie auto exposure. So this will do all the thinking for you. Now you have manual exposure. This is where you would go um, if you're more familiar with changing camera settings and stuff like that. You can manipulate the shutter speed, change the exposure, um, aperture, things like that. Then movie for close up demos. If you're doing products and you want to hold products up in front of the camera, you, would, you could set the camera to this mode and the, basically the camera will not get confused focusing on your face and it'll focus on the product. Now you have movie IS mode. 
So it'll enable image stabilization. It might crop in just a little bit on you, but it'll give you a more smoother shot if you're walking with the camera. And it just takes the thinking out of it for you. You don't have to know that you have to enable active stabilization. Now you got HDR movies. So this is a, another advanced mode if you wanna try that out. So in movie mode, you also have the quick menu and notice how it's a little bit different than what it looked like when in photography mode. So you have video specific features, more so like image stabilization over here. You have your frame rate option here, movie record size that you can play with if you want. Now, if we go into the menu while in video mode, notice how you have this option here that was not here before called high frame rate mode. High frame rate mode is how you get the camera into 100 frames per second, 120 frames per second. So if we go in there and we hit enable, Note that audio is not recorded in this mode, so you will not have sound. Now that we have high frame rate on, notice how we have 120p there. So that's 120p and it has a compressed version and a regular version IPB and IPB light. And you could notice how much longer you can record with IPB light. So you got 14 and a half minutes approximately, and it pretty much doubles when you record in IPB light. So that's how high frame rate mode works. And you know, I like that it has the high frame rate mode, but I wish it was just part of the other frame rate modes because you have to actually enable it, you know? So now I have to actually go and turn this off in order to get back to the regular frame rate modes. And look what it does. It defaults it back to the wrong frame rate, like not the one I was using last. So you have to go in here and actually change it back. So I have to go back to 4K 24P right there, which is the one that I like to use most. So that's how you do slow motion video with high frame rate. Now, one other thing I wanted to show you here is if you keep going to the right, you have time-lapse movie option. And if you go in here, you can enable it. It's got a bunch of different scenes here, presets, or you can just go straight up custom. And if you hit set, you can go in here and you can customize the settings. All right, guys, so for these last modes, the manual aperture and shutter speed, I'm gonna go into the lab and set the camera up. So let's go do that quick and I'll show you how those modes work. All right, so I have an aperture priority mode here, but what I wanna do is I wanna go into the menu here and we do need to change something so you can see the depth of field change on the screen while you're viewing, and that's under display simulation. Now this is turned off by default, I don't know why. Well, it's not turned off, it's just not set to depth of field. So now it, I want exposure and depth of field. So I'm gonna select that, and now it'll give us like a true live view, like the Sony cameras do, straight out of the uh, box. So now you can see the background depth of field change. So when I focus, it's gonna open up the aperture. You can see how the lights in the background are flashing. That's because the aperture on the camera is actually opening up to take the photo. But watch when I change the F number now. So right now I'm at F 6.3 in aperture priority mode, and I have the, the lens zoomed all the way to 45 millimeter. So when I press the shutter down, you could see the bokeh balls in the background there are kind of blurry. Now, if I focus on the background, you could see the foreground dollar bill is blurry. Go back over there, and if I take the photo, that's what it looks like. So that background blur is depth of field. So now watch when I change the F number to like F25. You see how the background looks sharp now? That's what it means by depth of field. So if you want the background and the foreground sharp, you would need to raise this number up to like F16 or higher. If you want the background blurry, the closer you are to your subject and the further the background is from your subject, the blurrier the background will be. So that's pretty much what aperture priority does. Now, for low light shooting, you would want this F number as low as possible. For the blurriest background possible, you would want this number as low as possible. Now, you might know if you've been shopping for lenses that the fast aperture lenses will be like F1.4, F1.8, for example. This lens is F6.3 at 45 millimeter. So that's why the background isn't as blurry as it is in this photo, for example, where I'm using the Zeiss 55 millimeter F1.8 lens. All right, guys, so I just wanted to give you a closer look here. Now I'm more at the minimum focus distance. So now I'm focused on the quarter. And again, in aperture priority mode, you could see now how blurry the background is because I'm much closer to the subject. So now watch when I dial the aperture down to like F20. Now you can see the background getting sharper. And notice how when I go to focus, you could see it blurs for a second. 
again, that's because the camera is opening up the aperture to make it easier to focus, and then it's stopping it back down to what I have the aperture set to. So in this case, F F32, and that will give you like the most depth of field. I wouldn't recommend going that high though. I wouldn't go much higher than like 18 or 20 because you do get you do lose a little bit of quality when you go that high on the aperture. But anyways, that's how aperture works. All right guys, so we're in shutter priority mode right now. And what's so cool about shutter priority is you can control time. And when you can control time, you can freeze action like you can see here with the water, or you can actually create motion blur and you can get cool uh, longer exposures with looks like that, which is just awesome. So let me show you what I mean. So as you can see here by default, the shutter is now controlled by the dial on the top of the camera. So if I turn the dial, you can see the shutter speed changing. Now watch what happens when I lower the shutter speed. So I'm just going to lower it to like one fifth of a second. Now watch when I spin the fan. Now I just captured motion blur as you could see in the photo. So you can see if I hit the info button here, you can see because the shutter was set to a slow one fifth of a second, that amount of time allowed the fan to spin around multiple times during that, you know, fraction of time. So now watch what happens when I speed up the shutter. Let's speed it up to say one four hundredth, one five hundredth of a second. Let's go. Now watch. Look at that. It froze the action. So this simulates, you know, trying to get somebody like a sports situation or a kid running around the yard. You're going to need a faster shutter speed uh, if you want to freeze the action. And if you want motion blur, you can crank that shutter speed down and the camera will do all the other thinking for you. You can, of course, change the ISO manually if you want. It is set to auto here, but you can change it. And again, of course, you have the Q menu and you can go in there and manipulate stuff as well. And in the playback menu here, by the way, guys, if you just pinch out, you can pinch out like so and zoom into your pictures and then you can scroll like so. It's so easy to use this touch screen interface. Then you can do double tap even to just bring up an image. Double tap again, it'll zoom in all the way for you. And then you just hit menu to go back out. So. Again, that's just playback menu. All right, let's switch this beast into manual mode and I'll show you what full control looks like. So manual exposure just gives you full power um, to just expose exactly how you want. And what you use here for reference is the meter in the very center here. So that is your exposure meter. So now watch what happens. Because I have the ISO set to auto, the camera will still auto expose uh, and do a pretty good job unless it runs out of usable ISO. So what I want to do is change this to a hard number. So let's put it at ISO 200. It's pretty dark in here. Let me go to 400 actually. All right, so now we're at ISO 400. I'm hard setting that. And you can see it's underexposed. You could tell it's underexposed because the screen is dark, number one. But number two, look at that meter there. See how it's all the way like by negative, it's like in between three and two there. So what I can do is I can slow the shutter speed down to allow more time for the light to gather at the sensor. So it's just leaving that shutter open for a longer period of time. And that is one way to help expose. Now, another way would be to change the aperture. So the aperture doesn't have too much room left, but if I go here, let me change the aperture to like F11, for example. And now if I, so the aperture is at F11 here, so now if I change the shutter speed, I'm gonna to have to make it much slower in order to get a proper exposure. So now you can see I'm at one tenth of a second ISO 500 because the aperture is at F11. Now the aperture, as I already explained, is the size of the lens diaphragm. So F11 is gonna be much smaller. So it's gonna be harder for the light to get through that little hole. And think of it like water flowing through a hose. You know, the bigger the hose, the faster it can flow or the easier it can flow. Kind of works similar to that as an analogy. But check this out. Now I can lower the aperture to change the exposure. So let me raise the shutter speed a little bit. Let's say I want 1 60th of a second, but you could see it's too dark here. So I have two options. I could either raise the ISO or I could lower the aperture. And remember, the lower the aperture number, the larger the aperture hole is, which will allow more light to come in. So watch when I lower the aperture. Let's put it all the way down to, let's put it all the way down to F4.5, as you could see there. And now you could look at the meter and we have a proper exposure. 
So you can use aperture to control how much light gets in. Shutter speed controls how much time the shutter is open. And then ISO, so let's crank the shutter speed up. Let's say we want the camera at f4.5 and we want five, one five hundredth of a second because we're in a low light gymnasium scenario and we need to capture um, our kid playing volleyball. So our only option now, because the aperture can't open anymore, so I can't make that any larger or any lower of a number, um, a faster lens you could, like an f1.8 lens for example, but the kit lens only goes to f4.5. So the only thing we can do is raise the ISO. So if we go in here, we can actually just put it to auto if we want, like so, and that will automatically set the ISO. And you can see what the ISO chose. It chose 4,000. So that's what's required for a proper exposure with this setup. So that's how you would go about using manual mode. And manual mode's great because you can basically control the shutter speed, you know, independently and all that stuff. And it's a more advanced way of using the camera for those power users out there. So that's pretty much how that works, guys. All right, guys, so we're still in manual mode here, and I wanted to show you something else really quick. If you hit the exposure comp button here on the top of this little control pad, it'll switch from shutter speed to aperture to the meter here, which kind of acts as exposure comp. Or you can just touch them. You know, you can always just touch this stuff. Of course, the same thing with ISO, you can just touch it. Now, one other thing I wanted to show you is, let me just go back to shutter speed. Now, if you slow this all the way down, and you go all the way past 30, it turns into bulb mode. So that's how you get to bulb mode. If I just touch on the quarter, it'll focus there. Um, bulb mode will expose for as long as you hold the button down, the shutter button. So now if you're using the Canon app, you can use that for bulb mode and then you won't be touching the camera. But what this will allow you to do is get crazy long exposures, like longer than 30 seconds. So if you wanna get like two minute exposures or something like in really dark conditions, for example, you would use bulb mode for that. And again, you just hold the shutter down. And then as, as long as you hold it, you could see the countdown timer there. And then when you let go, it's gonna be very overexposed. You can see how overexposed it is because you know that was just way too long for this current lighting conditions. So that's how bulb mode works. All right, so I have the camera in manual mode here. I just wanna go back into the menu and show you a few other items here that I didn't cover earlier. Let's go in here. I just wanna show you a few other things here. You have digital teleconverter. You can turn this on if you want more digital zoom. That's what that feature does. Over here, you have ISO speed settings. Now, if you go in here, you can set your ISO. Right now, it's set to auto, but you could set your max for auto. So you can go in here and raise this all the way up if you want. I would put it at like 25, 600, like that. So this way you can get, you can actually get sharp shots in really low light um, conditions. So I would recommend that. Now, HDR PQ, this is a more advanced um, HDR shooting mode. You can turn that on here. All right, so HDR shooting, this is for recording video. HDR mode, this is like auto HDR. So if you turn this on, the camera will take an auto HDR. So it'll take multiple exposures and it'll combine them for you automatically and it'll auto align the photos as well, which is cool. Now you can set this for one shot only or you can set it for every single shot. So if you're walking around and you're just shooting auto HDR, you would set it to every shot. If you just have a single scenario, you know, and you're like, ooh, this might require auto HDR, that's where you would wanna to go to single shot only. So now if I go and take a photo, you can see it took multiple images and it's gonna combine them, auto align them, and that is the result. So that's what HDR mode stands for. And notice how it automatically turned it off because I only had it to single shot. So that's cool. You can just turn it for one shot if you want or just leave it on all the time. Um, I like that. Auto lighting optimizer, very similar to the Sony cameras. It'll just fill in the shadows a little bit for you. It'll try to recover the highlights a little bit. If you have that set to on, there's a couple different methods and how aggressive you want to be with it. Highlight tone priority, same situation. This will just help protect the highlights. You have a bunch of different options here. When using HDR PQ, you would want to use the D plus, as you can see here. It's just giving you that notice there, menu. All right, so down here you have picture style and there's a bunch of different options. I showed you this from the quick menu before, but this is where it is in the menu. 
And now clarity, this is a pretty cool feature. This will just give your photos a little bit more clarity, you know, so it adds a little bit more contrast. Um, it looks a little bit more grungy the higher you have clarity. If you want it to be a little bit softer, it'll like smooth things out if you lower the clarity. Um, that'll help with skin tones and things like that. Uh, it's a little smooth the skin a little bit if you lower the clarity. So you can play around with those things. Lens aberration correction. You can have this stuff turned on and off and it depends on the lens you're using with if this feature will be allowed or not. Like if you're using a Sigma lens or something, you might not be able to do this, but it does see the kit lens there, so that's cool. And you can also correct the lens optimizer here. If you go in there, you can change the strength of it. So I have it set to standard right now. Clicking menu to go back. Long exposure noise reduction. If you're taking really long exposures, you may want to have this on. It's up to you. High ISO speed noise reduction. So if you have your ISO set really high, remember in like low light conditions, you might have to jack up the ISO. You can turn the this feature on and, and dial in the power of the noise reduction. Very nice having those features. And then of course you have multi-shot noise reduction. That will take multiple shots, combine them, and it'll reduce the noise because it's taking multiple shots. Let's click OK. Dust delete data. Now if you have dust on the sensor, you can delete it here by uh, going into this option here, as you can see. Focus bracketing. This is a cool feature. If you're doing macro photography, it'll allow you to bracket the photos and it'll just change the focus as you take the shot. Now you have silent shutter function. Shutter mode. Now here you can change it from electronic first curtain to full-fledged electronic. I recommend leaving it on first curtain if you're taking photos. Release the shutter without the card. Already talked about that. Now image stabilization mode. Again, this is where you can go and you can turn the digital image stabilization on. This will give you a little more stabilization if you're walking around with the camera recording video and stuff. Or if you're trying to handhold with slower shutter speeds. It'll help you there. Now, customizing quick controls. If you go in here, remember the Q menu I showed you earlier? This is where you can go in and change that. So here are the options for the Q menu. And again, you can go in here and change this stuff if you want to. Very powerful customization on this camera. Even though it's like a beginner-oriented, entry-level camera, it's still giving you a tremendous amount of power for customization, which is just great because, you know, depending on how you like to use the camera, you can manipulate these things. So being able to change what's in the quick menu is super cool, um, especially if you don't use like half the features, you can put in there what you use. Now display simulation, I covered that in the lab. You need to change that if you wanna watch the depth of field change as you change your aperture. So I recommend having that set to this option here, exposure plus depth of field. I like that. Optical, again, if you're using flash photography. All right, so now ISO speed settings, this is for video. Notice how there's a little video camera there. If you go in there, it'll tell you what, is it, what the max is. So the max you can do for video is 12,800. You can't go as high as you can for photography and video mode. Now, auto slow shutter, what this will do is, if you're in super low light situations, it'll actually slow the shutter speed down to help brighten the exposure a little bit. So I have that on by default, but you might not want that because it will slow the shutter down. So you'll get a little bit of motion blur if you're moving and it, the shutter slows down a lot. So it just depends on what you're doing. But by default, that is on, just so you're aware. Now here you can turn the eye detection off if you want, if you don't want it to focus on the eye. Now here you can control the focus ring. Remember earlier I told you how it's set for manual focus, but you can change that if you want on some cameras. In here is where you can go and do that. You can change it as a, use it as a control ring as opposed to focus. So that's where you would go about doing that. Now in here is where you could go to reset the camera if you want. ISO expansion, I'm gonna turn that on. That will allow higher ISO. Now custom buttons, this is where you can go and customize the camera a little bit. If you go into custom buttons here, it'll show you how you can change things. So this is the shutter button, half press. You can go in here and you can change the record button if you want. The ISO button, this is a cool button to change. If you want, you can go in here and set it to something that you use more often, as you can see here. You're limited with the custom buttons on this camera, but it does give you some options, as you can see. So you can change this button as well. So this is where you would go to customize the camera if you want to. 
some of the buttons and stuff. And then again, customizing the control ring. You can go in there and you can mess with that. And then you can clear your customization settings here or your customized settings if you want. Now over here on the right, I wanna show you this because this is the My Menu area and this is awesome. So we're gonna to wanna to add a tab. Let's click OK. So now we just added a My Menu tab. So now if we go in here, you can now add items to the My Menu area. So select items to register, yes. So we can add image quality if we want. Let's add image quality. And we can scroll up to get to some of the options towards the end of the menu. Right here, format card. I always like to add that to my menu because I like formatting my memory card. So I'm gonna add that. And there's a ton of options in here as you can see. But anyways, that's what the my menu area is. And now you can see in the my menu area, I have these options in there. So now I can just format the memory card if I want to. You could see the format memory card, it's almost full. I don't want to format it though. I have sample photos on there. Now you can add multiple tabs to the My Menu and stuff. It's very powerful and uh, customizable. So, so many different ways to customize this camera and use it. All right guys, so that about wraps up the Canon R50 Beginner's Guide. I really hope you got what you were looking for in this guide. If you guys have any questions, please fire away in the comments section below and I will be happy to try and help you out. If you found this video helpful, please do me a favor, hit that thumbs up and be sure to hit that subscribe button. I plan on getting the Canon R8 next and I'll do a beginner's guide on that camera as well. So stay tuned. I also have the Canon R6 Mark II beginner guide and the Canon R10 beginner guide. If you guys have those cameras and need some assistance, they're very similar to the R50, but just a little different. So, all right, that's about it. I will catch up with you guys next time. I really appreciate you checking out my video and uh, have a great day. Take care.